this job, I've always thought, what, what one thing do you need to do? And I am very comfortable with determining that uh, I want to create the best possible opportunity, whether you've been here for a long time or whether you just moved to Idaho six months ago, uh, for our kids to want to uh, prosper here in Idaho, and that's who I am. So thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, first of all, good evening, everyone. Ooh, I'm having the same sensitivity. Uh, thanks to everyone watching uh, live, uh, all of our supporters across the state, uh, and every single citizen who has fully invested in tax policy, fiscal policy for our state. We have a lot going on right now, and it's a really critical time. Uh, I, first and foremost, am very privileged to be in this position to be a candidate for our state. I am a mother of two. I'm a businesswoman. I've served as a national leader for the last eight years. Uh, primarily as a senior executive uh, amongst my group. Uh, it's a $32 billion nonprofit corporation, and most of my special interests are in philanthropy, uh, growing jobs across the country, over 700,000, and uh, being able to serve the better interests of those in my community. Uh, now I'm able to apply this uh, experience. Uh, I may look young, but I'm not that young. But I really, truly appreciate the, uh, the good support of my mentors and friends, uh, my relatives who have raised me in this state, uh, because they've really taught me a lot about uh, my own background with agriculture and uh, ranching. And it's really all about you know, our fierce independence and how we can apply that to best practices when it comes to supporting our future growth of our economy. Uh, so here today now, uh, it's really, again, a privilege to be able to serve Idahoans, uh, bringing us back to traditional values of Idaho. Uh, as someone who has served in the State House for the last four years, I have not seen these traditional values to held up to the forefront where we have a government that has left out the goodwill of the people who are continuing to invest, but yet those investments are not coming back to our local citizens. They're not building up community as we are seeing education fail uh, year after year, and uh, we, see, we see healthcare become more and more expensive. And again, because we have such a, a vastly increasing population in our state, uh, we're not keeping up with our growth. So again, all these challenges and this small window of opportunity that we present to ourselves uh, which is why we're having this conversation, and it takes you know, a great deal of effort. So if I don't get this opportunity to thank those folks who put in the time and effort to collaborating, and you know, getting politicians together like this is like herding cats. So kudos to those folks, and uh, really I hope that we have a, a great conversation uh, and interactive conversation with our, our audience. Thank you. Let's start with some questions. We'll start with Paulette. So, be very general here. What areas in the state budget should we be spending more money on? Well, I would first uh, rephrase that. It's not about more spending. It's about better spending, smarter spending. Uh, when it comes down to smarter spending, we have to look at how do we grow our revenue base. Uh, we have to grow our economy. Uh, that would come by means of ensuring that we have more opportunities, uh, looking to manufacturing and creating um, proposals to you know, grow not only um, jobs and other resources, because I look at a lot of our ag industry, uh, but folks need to have options. You know, one area that I thought is really productive is to expand in hemp as we're importing. Uh, if we have to look at some of the options that we have uh, for education, because we have really created this, uh, what I like to look at is a deficit. We have lacked in uh, investments towards education, especially when it comes to K-12. We have really uh, positioned ourselves to the bottom of dang near everything when it comes to ratings in the country. Uh, top, on top of healthcare, uh, there's a better way that we can promote healthcare management in our state. Uh, there's clear data to show that uh, while folks have continued to pay uh, increasing premiums, uh, the state itself has not utilized the data that's available, uh, which is a disadvantage to all of us because as taxpayers, we want to be able to pay less, and uh, this is a great opportunity to expand Medicaid, uh, because we would save our state uh, not only 30 million, 39 million a year, but we would have an opportunity to really show uh, what we can do when we actually build uh, a data plan that is far more comprehensive and save our state hundreds of millions into the future. Uh, this is a missed opportunity for the state of Idaho, which is unfortunate, uh, because this is a millions which adds up to billions that we could have saved uh, taxpayers alone. Uh, so I see multiple opportunities even when it comes to uh, smarter spending for uh, transportation. 
you know, we've really uh, allowed our transportation system to fall down the hill. Uh, again, we're just kicking the can down the road, expecting everything to fix itself. Uh, most of our roads and bridges are outdated. We have still a $400 million deficit, as I like to look at it, because we have not kept up with maintenance. Uh, so therefore, we have to look at how are we going to keep up with those costs on top of the rising costs of additional roads uh, because of the tra increasing transportation because of our increasing population. So, kind of cut in short, he said we could talk as long as we want, by the way. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be as brief as possible. Uh, but again, getting back to uh, more so smarter investments because I want to see our children's future not be mortgaged into the future. I want to make sure that we're investing into all the right programs such as K-12. through uh, We have a shortage in teachers. We actually had a problem in rural education where many of our school districts started school last year uh, and I think it was roughly, oh, I can't remember the, the number off the top of my head, but we had more schools go without teachers in the first year. And it's unfortunate because as we have this teacher shortage, uh, we have actually uh, lost 400 teachers. So we have to look at how are we going to, going to support rural <coughs> education and increase teacher pay. Uh, but if we are not focusing on education and we're not advancing ourselves, especially when it comes down to career tech and voc vocational training, uh, we're missing out on multiple opportunities as we have a tech sector that's trying to rise up and grow in our state missing employment opportunities and, and missing revenue growth uh, as we, again, we have this fa the fast-growing economy. And uh, we just have to keep up with everything, but we're not offering our people much. We're not offering a world-class education, as is our constitutional responsibility. And of course, on top of that, even, uh, we have not optimized uh, additional resources that we have already sitting on the table when it comes to our surplus to go towards a universal pre-K program that in my opinion, as a mother of two, I've watched both of my sons successfully uh, approach education from K through now my sons uh, in uh, ninth grade, and to watch them become some of the, the rising, uh, most successful students across the country. Uh, my son actually fared out very well uh, in being in the 98th percentile because he started very young. He started at zero. And you could see that studies have shown when we educate our children earlier on, they're it's really truly the greatest investment that we can make. Uh, but honestly, I would tell you that we do have the money available and I think we're gonna talk about that later on. But uh, I wanna express to folks how critical it is that we spend wiser, smarter, and more efficiently. Brad, same thing. Where do you think we could be spending more money on? Well, there's a, a new sound system. Uh, uh, well, obviously, education, we spend 65% of our, our uh, available general fund dollars on education, about 50% of it on K-12. Uh, today, uh, no state has made a bigger investment in K-12 than the state of Idaho. We're, we're the first, the, the leading nation in the increase. And we had, you know, after the recession, we had a ways to go. But today, Idaho leads the nation in in increasing teacher pay more than any other state in the union. Uh, we've got more work to do there, but uh, I, I couldn't be happier uh, with the consensus. Uh, we've, got, we've got other things that we've got to uh, address, but there's a, a consensus that exists in Idaho between our parents, our educators, our trustees, the business community, um, all the players, and it shows up when we pass an appropriation bill. You know, to increase every year over 100, an increase, a hundred million dollar increase every year in the Idaho legislature and only have a few no votes, I think reflects uh, the values of the people of the state of Idaho and, and what our direction is. Uh, going forward, we've got one more year left in the, in the um, existing uh, five-year plan, which is a, a great gift to whoever the new governor is, because as we if we implement that uh, fifth year, that means we've got a year to bring everybody together to say, what are we gonna do for the next five years? How do we plan out what we need to do? I think we need to do more in early childhood from the literacy standpoint, and I've got a plan to do that. We've gotta put more money into the career technical area because the whole state of Idaho is, is just desperate for more CTE jobs, and we gotta continue uh, to make improvements in higher education. 
Uh, there's a pretty good report on what needs to be done there. There's a couple studies going on, uh, but we need to work on all three of those fields. But one of the things that's taken place in Idaho, which is a big change over my lifetime study and education policy, is we've really grayed the lines between K-12, career technical, and higher education. Today, Idaho again leads the nation in advanced opportunities where your, your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors are having an opportunity to get college credits while they're in school. So that traditional higher ed has now transferred into our K-12. And we're doing more of that in the CTE area. So what we used to consider the dark line uh, between K-12 and CTE and uh, career technical and higher education has grayed, and that's a good thing. Uh, these, these high school juniors and seniors, and I've spoken a couple commencements where those kids that come across the stage have their associate's degree as a result of the hard work they did. That raises the rigor of the high schools. That's a better compensation program for our professionals in the classroom. And it's, it's really a good thing, but we have more work to do there. Healthcare, we've got to get our arms around the healthcare costs. Uh, we used to have the most affordable healthcare of any state in the union, and that has not been the case since the Affordable Care Act passed. And we've got work to do there in the substance abuse and the mental health area, and then, of course, finally, transportation. Uh, I, I chaired the Transportation Task Force. Uh, we have to put more money into it, but there's actually some savings we can do by consolidating overhead, particularly in the cities, counties, and highway districts, and continuing to, to do a better job. Uh, the statistics are uh, our bridges that were engineered to last for 50 to 60 years now that need to last, well, it was 120. We backed that up to about 90 years now, uh, but we're gonna have to invest some more money in transportation. But today, because of the thriving economy in Idaho, we're taking a quarter of every surplus dollar and putting it into the transportation, and that's helping, but we're probably gonna have more work to do going forward. Those are the, th there's, there's lots of places to spend money, uh, and, and probably corrections. We've gotta reduce the recidivism rate the revolving door that exists in those institutions. Uh, first, we got to keep our citizens safe, but second, we got to lower the recidivism rates. Thanks. I was just sitting up here, I was looking at our footwear. I wonder if anyone could tell the two people born in Idaho and the guy from Philly. <laughs> <laughs> well, get your set. Yeah, I haven't broken down a cowboy boot yet. So, Brad, then, what are some areas of the state budget where we could possibly spend less then? Well, I spoke a little bit about it. We, uh, we have a lot of entities of government. Uh, and part of that's a result of when we passed the 1%, we basically capped how much entities of government could grow. And as a result of that, we had a proliferation of, of, uh, of municipalities. And, you know, we, you know, consolidating school districts, consolidating highway districts, I'm, I'm not saying we're gonna just uh, get rid of a bunch of them, but we can save a lot of money by consolidating overhead. Uh, you know, here in Canyon County with the number of school districts we have here, I don't think we have, that we ought to touch the Notice, Parma, Wilder, Homedale, uh, Middleton, but there's no reason that we can't create some incentives for those school districts to save overhead. IT, HR, uh, and currently in Canyon County, perhaps one of the best models is the CASA model that's out here, where we do special education and career technical in one, one uh, uh, very well-run program, and that allows those other school districts to not provide those expensive programs. We need to duplicate that all, all over the state. And, and the other place where we could save a lot of money in Idaho is in IT. Uh, I chaired the Cyber Task Force for the governor. We made an initial recommendation to, to have the task force and then we made the final recommendation about changes. As, as technology's evolved in, in over Idaho, everybody's bought their own little computer system, and then they've had to hire their own IT people, and uh, we have proliferated uh, technology in agencies large and small all over the state of Idaho. I looked at it from the cyber standpoint. What's our exposure to your data uh, being at risk. 
And one of the conclusions that all the experts said, you have to have less surface area. You have to have less exposure. So we need to take your data, whether it's your tax data or your whatever goes to health and welfare, Department of Labor, Fish and Game, we need to take that data and make it where it's safe, uh, to where uh, it's protected, to make sure that your data is safe. And when we do that, we'll save a lot of money by consolidating IT. Lots of areas. Uh, you know, we're not only overtaxing our working poor, but you know, let's start with some three big ones. There, you know, we see major mismanagement and overspending on uh, not only uh, transportation, but we are excuse me, uh, our infrastructure in some areas. But I'm looking at our utilities uh, when it comes down to how much we pay on restructuring dams. Uh, we have high utility rates here in our state, mainly uh, servicing utilities to other states like California. Uh, which has cost taxpayers roughly $700 million, uh, which is really unfortunate because I'd like to save that money and reinvest that back into the state of Idaho. Uh, fish mitigation, which the uh, state of Idaho con continues to expand taxpayer resources on because of these uh, four snake river dams. Uh, we can be wiser in that sort of spending and really save, again, Idahoans this kind of money that should go back and be reinvested into communities. Uh, I also see the mismanagement of our current health care program. You know, Dr. Alquist, he had this right in the primary. He actually said that there's a better way for us to manage our healthcare, state healthcare program. Uh, we have to really utilize data. Unfortunately, this government, our government, has expanded employees, government spending, exponentially in the last four years alone, creating positions that have not captured the data that we need to ensure that we have a really uh, strong way for us to not only collect it, but make it more efficient. Uh, it is stated in the uh, Medical Association, which is part of the National Institute of Health, that when they created this consortium, they had a study that came up amongst these medical uh, ex uh, 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 professionals. And these medical professionals had a developed statement that really, uh, for us to be more efficient in terms of healthcare, we have to deconstruct our current healthcare model. And because they said this, no one nationally has really followed that system. But it comes down to just simply gathering the data and then reconstructing from the ground up a better health plan. Idaho is one of two states in the country that has not followed this national plan for a self-insured health insurance plan. Which is unfortunate because if we had followed it, we would save roughly 20 to 30 percent, which is around 100 plus million dollars a year to taxpayers. So savings, cost savings would be increase simply by better management, utilizing data, actually capturing data from officials who work for Idaho, who are just working, again, more efficiently. So I see a lot of areas where we're overexpending and we would save some resources. So not only uh, by our utilities, uh, wasting by restructuring dams that are uh, not effective, not saving our state citizens money. Uh, and then on top of that, we have uh, another area of need that I see which is how we are expending our resources into our criminal justice system, into our prison system. We would save money alone by simply reducing the criminal rate that we have in our prison system. Uh, by one, not arresting folks for uh, marijuana or cannabis use. We need to work to decriminalize cannabis in this state. By doing so, we would save $23 million in arrests alone. $23 million on top of the fact that we would reinvest into rehabilitative programming, uh, investing in also rural uh, clinics, hospitals in our state, uh, where we can expand resources in that arena to ensure that our citizens stay within the communities and are able to then contribute back to society in a healthier way versus sending them off to prison, increasing our prison population and spending more per inmate than we do more uh, per student. So we need to balance out our structure because I'd rather see us invest more in education than we do in our prison population. You guys covered just about all the questions. I think we're done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, one, one area I don't think we've, we, we've talked about too much yet is about transportation. Does Idaho really, do we invest enough in our uh, transportation needs? And if not, what should we do, what should we do about it? No, uh, and I would say that you know, we definitely have a lot to do there, uh, much to catch up with, especially when it comes to a broadband infrastructure. 20% uh, of our state uh, needs to catch up to the rest of our market, our worldwide market. Uh, so we have to make sure that while uh, rural citizens have the same access as those in the urban areas, 
uh, ensuring that we expand broadband for not only business and healthcare, but education. You know, we have a, a real opportunity here to uh, ensure that the rest of Idaho's citizens or children are able to get into virtual technology, virtual learning, and of course telemedicine, which is great for women who need a certain service for uh, reproductive health care. And, you know, and then I also think of just the, the, uh, the fact that in rural Idaho, where I'm from, we haven't really connected the corridors. We have uh, rural transportation, excuse me, transportation needs that could be better addressed. And a lot of this comes down to ensuring that we support uh, regional authorities, which you know, we have one in the northern region and two in the southern region, but they, they pretty much have stalled out because they are worried about not having enough uh, support at the state level. But if we make sure that we have uh, the available budget and we continue to invest in the rural transportation arenas, we can ensure that rural transportation is connected from the northern region to the southern region, uh, which will not only boost the economy, but will, it will help with education, our local universities, uh, ensuring that we're able to impact uh, jobs. Uh, but I see it just a real opportunity in terms of tourism as well. Uh, so there's a lot of advancements there. Uh, on top of that, we have a major opportunity to address uh, the, the fact that we are, again, reaching the uh, outdated roads and bridges, uh, multiple bridges we have already seen that are uh, well overdue in restructuring. Uh, but we have a growing commerce in terms of transportation needs, freight trucks that are going across our uh, roads and bridges. And, uh, so we have uh, a responsibility. But again, I, again, it goes down to not mortgaging our children's future and addressing these needs up front. And for me, I look at it as localizing uh, tax because we right now are preempting that local control and this is how we grow government at the state level, but I want to make sure that we shift back our, the statewide uh, governance to the local level. Uh, to me, it goes down to local option tax, local control, ensuring that local decision makers have the right to ensure that they can see the needs of their communities and make those decisions as they see fit. Uh, and because we have not allowed these local communities, local counties to do so, it really has uh, put a uh, stop to not only their growth, but their opportunities to ensure that their citizens are safe, secure, and have opportunities to economic growth. Brad, what about transportation? Are we investing enough in our transportation? Area? Well, I, I, I'm on record as saying we need to invest more, but it, it should be hard to raise fees. It, it's part of the reasons Idaho is one of the most uh, fiscally stable, fiscally sound, balanced budget states is because of the DNA that uh, the citizens of Idaho have it's just hard to it's hard to raise fees it's hard to raise taxes uh, I was an advocate for the last one uh, but w the citizens of Idaho have every right to expect that we're doing everything possible and the last option is to increase whatever the costs are of uh, uh, particularly a dedicated fund uh, today we're putting a general fund we're basically taking a quarter of our surplus and, and put it into roads, and that's a good thing. Uh, but I, I, I come from a position that, uh, that we need a dedicated source of revenue because when the economy contracts, and they always do, uh, kids will win out over roads, and they should. And that's why you need, uh, you need a dedicated source of revenue for roads. Our, our sources in Idaho are protected by our Constitution. You can't take registration money and you can't take uh, fuel tax money and put it anywhere else, and that's a good thing. Uh, we, uh, in these flush times, we're putting some general funds into it, but I think collectively the state needs to have a heartfelt decision about uh, putting some more revenue into well-planned, uh, not only maintenance, but also connectivity. Um, when we did Garvey, and uh, Senator Bunderson sitting here, and he was the first person to propose it. Uh, I was always reluctant, and he remembers this, uh, because I thought we should do Garvey, but we should pay for it. Because today we're taking about $75 million that we should be using for uh, maintenance, and we're paying debt service off of Garvey. But Garvey was a great thing. Uh, the, your interstate out here is a result of Garvey funding. When we had the big recession, the fact that we had Garvey and we kept those good contractors here in Idaho and provided jobs was a lot of the shock absorber we had in Idaho when the recession, recession hit. It was a great idea. I just wish we'd have paid for it now instead of paying for it uh, going forward. 
as we get Garvey paid down, there'll probably be another, I assume there'll be one uh, proposed, uh, but right now we're gonna need a little more money. I think we're gonna need it. I don't know what the federal government's gonna do, but we need to be available if they say, if you have matching money, we'll match it. Uh, I haven't seen that yet, uh, but w we have to put more money into, into uh, our roads. Uh, just briefly about uh, the connectivity for internet. Uh, you know, we, we paid for, not the most efficient way we sh should have, but we paid for a lot of internet connectivity that went out to all our high schools. One of the things that we aren't doing that I'm advocating for, and, and actually we got it done in Emmett, when I asked my mayor, uh, when they got ready to tear up the streets, I says, are you putting in conduit? So if we need to put more fiber, or we need to put electric lines down for electric cars, you got all the streets tore up, you got all the sidewalks tore up, and we don't do enough of that. We shouldn't be paying the state of Idaho, whether it's through a commerce grant or transportation, we shouldn't be tearing up any roads if we're not putting in either dark fiber or conduit uh, so we can increase connectivity all over the state of Idaho. That would be something we can do very inexpensively. I do know that between uh, going north of Coeur d'Alene, the highway job right that's going in right now, they are putting in that dark fiber, which is gonna be a great additive but we are all over the place. We've got rural communities uh, that got way better connectivity than, than I do a few blocks from the state capitol, and then we've got, uh, we got areas where there's no connectivity. Uh, we have started in the Idaho Rural uh, uh, Partnership. They've got a plan uh, that, that we need to implement, and that plan needs to be implemented, whether it's through uh, some kind of an incentive tax or, or whatever it is uh, to get more connectivity because as these rural communities go from an older economy to a new economy, they have to have good connectivity. I'd like to respond to that. Okay, sure. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, it, the challenge is when we are talking about how proud we are about the Garvey bond, the Garvey bond is not something we should be proud of. It's unfortunate because we, again, have mortgaged the children's future. We're expecting our children to get themselves out of debt that we've created. Why I look at this as a problem is our auto administration, the auto administration, has not done Idaho citizens very well. In that matter, because they have lacked future sight, lacked vision in the fact that if they would have paid for transportation at the time that it was due, or at least pushed it back to local authorities, that would have helped local citizens decide for themselves which roads and bridges needed to be addressed at the time they needed to be addressed. As we all know, the longer you sit on these decisions, costs will increase. I mean, everything goes up with inflation. So now we are in extreme debt because of this. And on top of these uh, growing balloon payments that citizens are going to have to dig themselves out of, we have still a need to keep up with the current population growth. So we're constantly trickling and trying to keep up. Uh, but this is not the way we need to be. This is lack of leadership and unfortunately, the lack of foresight. So this is not something that I'll, I wanna be uh, attributed to as far as the carbon bonds being a good thing for Idaho citizens. We're about half time now, so let's uh, go from expenditures to revenues, everybody's favorite subject. So Brad, do you believe the current tax load is fair to Idahoans? And is it appropriately distributed among different types of households and businesses? And of course then, what changes, if any, would you propose? Well, Idaho's uh, system of taxation is, uh, has been uh, always heralded as a three-legged stool. Uh, you know, we started off where it was, there were only two kinds of tax in Idaho, sin tax and property tax. Uh, you know, originally they even taxed the knives and forks and, and utensils and plates in your house. Uh, over the years, obviously, that uh, it, we've migrated, and of course, when we put in income tax, uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was the second leg. And then in the 60s, when we put in sales tax, that was the third leg. Today, we have all three legs. Uh, if you look at most analysis of the state of Idaho, they will say, overall, uh, our tax system in Idaho is relatively fair. But the tax system is dynamic. I always say that Good tax policy should be fair, simple, predictable, and competitive. Well, competitive changes relative to what the federal government does 
and relative to what the states around us do. So if we want to be competitive, and we have a lot of fringe areas. We're right on the edge of one here at Caldwell. If you get over to, to Payette and Weezer and New Plymouth and Parma, uh, with Ontario right next door, uh, with no sales tax, they suffer the ravages of that edge effect. So does Lewiston, Moscow, Priest River, Malad, all those uh, border communities are affected by the competitiveness of taxes on, on the other states. You know, there's some states that don't have income tax. Uh, people always talk about Washington. This is really tax policy boring stuff. But they tax, I know, I know Jas, other than Jasper and I, uh, but, but they tax on the gross. So if you're a business, the very first dollar you make gets taxed in Washington, but they don't have income tax. Uh, we are always looking at our tax system. Last year when the big tax bill was passed in December, there were only two states that went out and say, this is a windfall to the states, the economy in Idaho is good, we should give that back to the taxpayers. It was just Georgia and Idaho were the first two states that said, we are not gonna take this windfall. There's a lot of states that took the windfall because of the uh, federal tax bill and the deductibility of insurance. I'm proud that in Idaho, uh, we gave that money back to the myriad of taxpayers that had paid it. Today, the income tax rate in Idaho is the lowest it's been since 1936. And, and, but we still got states around us without income tax. But we've got to fund government. If we lower income taxes, is it gonna be sales tax? Is it gonna be property taxes? So we're always in a constant battle to maintain the balance of that three-legged stool. But for me, I run all those decisions through one filter. Is it fair, simple, predictable, and competitive? And I can argue that sometimes competitive may not be fair, it may not be simple. Uh, but that's a good place for me to start when I look at tax policy, when ja Jasper and I look at it. And Paul, that too, so is our tax load fair? I like to be a little optimistic. I say for the most part, uh, I can agree with part of it. Uh, you know, I look at the national structure and I see how those below the poverty level, some who are making 6,000 are not taxed. You know, we should apply some of that to Idaho. Uh, Idaho citizens who are making between six to 7,000 are taxed very high. I think it's roughly now at 6.7%, uh, but don't hold me to that media. Let me check my, my notes. But um, I think that this is why we need to apply what's good, what's working for the national, and apply that here locally. We can do better. This is where I can see improvements being made, but let's not base our state budget off of our working poor. We need to balance out the system to be far more fair. These are just simple solutions. Uh, the other areas that I see, uh, kind of like Jeff Bezos today with Amazon, he increased wages. You all see that? I thought that was exceptional. Uh, we want to make sure that we get to bringing this livable wage economy, society, culture to Idaho, whereas we are at a loss right now here nationally. Uh, we can really work on that, and this is why as governor I want to make sure that we're incentivizing and doing better on not heavily taxing those businesses who are providing not only a, a better wage, but being uh, better in innovation and good to their employees. Uh, so there are multiple opportunities for us to really better our tax system, our structure, uh, as well as uh, off-ramping uh, those who are on uh, exemptions. We have a lot of uh, corporations, uh, special interest groups who are exempted in the state of Idaho. Uh, this is where I want to make sure that we take a hard look on what's necessary, what's not necessary, uh, because we have some big box stores in this state who have made it hard for local small businesses. We have to create a more fair, balanced system in this regard. Uh, so we have a lot on our hands uh, because these exemptions have rolled up to over $2 billion a year. And if we're unfairly taxing local businesses and letting off the hook these big box stores like Walmart, then you know that there is a problem. And I definitely don't want to continue overtaxing local citizens when it comes to increasing taxes by the supplemental levies that we have in rural uh, counties of our state, or when it comes to indigent care. You know, we're continuing to increase taxes upon taxes at the local level, unfortunately. And so this is where I see a high need for us to start tackling those challenges, and these are becoming greater problems you know, each year as citizens are now trying to face uh, whether they're going to uh, pay their health care bill, pay their light bill, or child care, uh, and of course being paycheck to paycheck, and more of our folks 
becoming homeless and declaring bankruptcy. You know, we have a rising number of our youth who are homeless in our schools. So we have a, a high area where people are being ignored and left out of these conversations. Uh, and if, as Idaho's citizens are only facing low minimum wage jobs, which is all they have, then we have few folks barely making ends meet, barely getting by. So we have, uh, we have challenges, but as governor, this is where I want to see us balance out our structure. Let's talk about a specific tax that people have been uh, discussing quite a bit. And it's a grocery tax we have here. So in Idaho, we all pay 6% sales tax on food. Now, uh, at the end of the year, you get a, each individual gets $100 credit. Senior citizens get 120. No, I'm not there yet. Uh, and that can be claimed on your income tax return or through some other forms uh, also. Should the, the state be having a sales tax on food? And if we would get rid of it, which some people have called for, uh, how do we make up the lost revenue then? Well, we have a lot of citizens who certainly are in favor of eliminating the grocery tax, which I am firmly in favor of. I uh, not only want to eliminate the grocery tax, but I want to eliminate the grocery tax credit, which has become very ineffective for uh, poor families in the state of Idaho, uh, wholly unnecessary. And because we have this grocery tax credit, which is, uh, or excuse me, grocery tax, uh, it's an $80 million shortfall. That is easily made up by simply addressing uh, a lot of our inadequacies and the mismanagement of our current state budget as is. Uh, simply going to address health care, expanding Medicaid. Uh, expanding Medicaid would save our state over $600 million within the next 10 years alone. Uh, when we look at how we're going to apply medical practices, we need to get back to holistic uh, health management. Uh, when you look at the state, or excuse me, the national level, uh, it's said that 87% of uh, national uh, health care spending goes towards uh, critical care. Here in Idaho, we have more and more citizens who are not able to access simple health care, simple provider, and that goes back to the local counties who pay more in indigent care. And they have up to 11,000 per, uh, per, uh, uh, excuse me, per patient that they can cover. Uh, and because this has become such a huge expense, uh, a lot of the major challenges have come back to why we need to eliminate the con catastrophic fund just by simply expanding Medicaid, ensuring that every single Idaho citizen can have access to uh, health insurance. Now, because of those savings alone, you know, this is just one area, but Idaho's uh, st state employees, as I've mentioned before, if we just simply utilized good data, uh, applying this and becoming a self-insured, which was have, has the same fully, uh, not only fully funded, but uh, full health care plan covering everything, uh, we would save the state another $100 million per year. Uh, these are good data, good uh, management plan, but again, cost savings to the state of Idaho. And, you know, when you look at that, all, the, all the other things that we apply, uh, especially when I look down to uh, the prison system, uh, I always see this as a, a huge problem because I'm from rural Idaho. And people in my community, they're tired of seeing their folks being sent off to the prison system. You know, and these high recidivism rates and then people being utilized for cheap labor within the prison system. Uh, I want to make sure that we're reinvesting back into the communities and that in itself would be cost savings. And these dams, I look at many of these areas of interest. Uh, as long as we are still continuing to pay, even, I mean, even that in itself, Jasper, is a huge cost. About $700 million at the taxpayer's expense and then the, ut the rising cost of utility rates. Uh, so there's multiple options, multiple opportunities, and of course we have major, major opportunities to grow our revenue base by simply uh, utilizing a better energy plan, a clean energy plan to decarbonize our future, which would also save citizens here in our state, which is uh, removing the monopolization of our energy industry, uh, ensuring that we can open up our state to clean energy with solar, biomass, geothermal, and building a cleaner uh, energy plan into the future on top of optimizing ag. We need to ensure that our agriculturalists uh, have more opportunities and that we're building more of a, kind of like a Teach for America plan where we have a farm corps. So we're working with local universities and building into the ag industry to innovate for our farmers so that they can have a higher GDP because as we move into the future, we're really missing out opportunities if we're not looking to the long-term solutions instead of trying to fix everything with these uh, short band-aid solutions uh, like the Garvey bond, unfortunately. 
So we have to be more innovative in everything that we do from here on out. We have to stop wasting taxpayer resources. Uh, we can actually even start to cut back on sales tax, start cutting back on income tax, just as, by, as long as we start tightening our belt and becoming more responsible. Brad, grocery tax. Should we be, taxing, uh, should we be having a sales tax on uh, groceries? Well, I, 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 Jasper, I went through the litany of the border communities that have all been negatively impacted by sales tax on groceries. <laughs> Obviously, you know, Weezer, Payette, New Plymouth, uh, Lewiston, Osco, Post Falls, Coeur d'Alene, every one of those will be, uh, have been disadvantaged because of what we do on sales tax, well, all sales tax, but sales tax on groceries is a big part of it. Um, so I've, I've advocated that we repeal it, but that we make sure that that 70 to $80 million that, uh, that it doesn't tip over the apple cart for our commitment for education. At the same time that's taken place, um, there's a, a lot of talk at the federal level about the Quill decision, which is, uh, which is a Supreme Court decision that basically uh, doesn't allow the states to collect uh, sales tax from online sellers. The state's done a little bit, the federal government's done a little bit. We've even had some online sellers, Amazon in particular, that said they will pay the tax, but it's only on Amazon direct products. I anticipate that uh, that is going to continue to migrate, and that will be a lot of the money to take care of that uh, uh, loss of revenue on, on that side. And if taxes are going to be fair, simple, predictable, and competitive, it's only fair that those online uh, sales are taxed, and that should more than offset for the fact that we're taxing the most fundamental need of all Idahoans, and that's our groceries. Let's get to the wonky subject I can figure out. Figure here. Surplus eliminator, okay? Which I used to call my old car that. But basically, it requires that if our tax revenues are above what's budgeted, that we split that ex excess revenue, we call it excess, between the state's rainy day savings fund, which is officially the, for us know, as the budget stabilization fund, and also it gets split with road and bridge projects. Is this the right way to be handling uh, this situation of when tax revenue comes in higher than budgeted? And is our rainy day fund sufficiently uh, funded? I think so. Um, uh, you know, that's always an issue about how, how big should government uh, grow their uh, shock absorber uh, or should we give it back to the people? Um, and so, uh, we are just about, we're not quite to where we were uh, when we had the big recession in 2009. And uh, it was incredibly important to the state that we have that uh, shock absorber. Uh, that, that, you know, a lot of other states, you know, had to make more draconian cuts. Uh, you know, they were turning prisoners out. Uh, they were laying off state police. They were making bigger cuts into education. And we didn't because we had that rainy day fund. We're about out, up to that level, and we've got an automatic fill mechanism that's also in code, and we've reached the level to where the legislature this year is gonna have to make a decision on, on that part of the, of the uh, rainy day fund. The other part of it uh, goes into transportation, and some of it's dedicated to go out to local transportation, highway districts, cities, and counties. Uh, you know. It, if in the good times, and there's no question in Idaho, we're having great times right now. We lead the nation in job growth. We lead the nation in income growth. We should be preparing for the inevitable slowdown. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen, but I think it's only prudent that we plan for it. So I think there's gonna be a lot of interest um, uh, by the legislature, and I know the, the, the people that, particularly the local people that need road money in maintaining that surplus eliminated. Well, that surplus eliminator, are we doing the right thing with uh, when revenues come in above budgeted? And is our, do we have enough money in that rainy day fund now? The irony of calling it the rainy day fund because it's already raining in Idaho. I would say that uh, the surplus eliminator is great uh, in terms of how we're able to cut back, but those resources need to go back to the communities. The people are investing into the state budget because they need to, they know that as a collective that they need to resurface those roads and bridges and transportation and seek the needs and the services of the people that deserve it. 
uh, especially when it comes down to education. Uh, the Rainy Day Fund could really have helped the, the fact that we have a shortage in teachers. Uh, why are we 50th in the country when it comes to teacher pay? We need to improve not only teacher pay, but increase teachers uh, because we have again, schools who have gone without. Uh, the fact that our teachers are going without resources in schools, why are we not utilizing those funds in our education system? A lot of questions here, and, and really it's very practical solutions. And I'd like to see those resources go back to the people, not go back to corporations for corporate welfare, which is unfortunate, because uh, this is why as governor we're gonna have to take uh, the hard no over the easy right and make sure that we dramatically curtail these tax incentives and subsidies that we created by the state system, becoming an ineffective government, working against the people, working against Idaho citizens. Uh, but now we get to this opportunity to restructure those resources uh, back into states, uh, our states, counties, local school districts, and our families. This is where I would like to see these monies go into. Well, my watch says, and I still do wear a watch, I don't have a look at time with a cell phone. We're about done with our time, so I want to give you each a, 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 a few minutes to, to conclude on things. We started with Brad, right? So Paulette, we want to start with, our, with your conclusion. Well, first, I want to thank you, Jasper, for being such a great host. You too fine. I told you I should have brought my cardigan. You should have sent me the memo. I didn't know yeah. <laughs> Next time. You uh, better than me, so <laughs> I didn't. I do want to thank uh, my opposition, uh, Lieutenant Governor Brad Little and his wife. Uh, they're very good people. And, uh, of course, everybody else for being here and putting up with us in this conversation. I know talking tax policy is not the funnest conversation to be had, but uh, we are thankful for everyone for their patience and their excitement. We have a lot of enthused young people who want to see where we're going into uh, the future of our state. Uh, the major opportunity here is seeing what kind of leadership will truly fight for the citizens of Idaho. I am that person. Uh, I truly believe that as someone who is uh, connected to this land, connected to every single individual, young and old, that my heart is in the right place because I am Idaho. I stem from a generation of thousands of years of leaders who were great chiefs, men and women, who fought for their people, but they fought for dear life, for everything that is good. And as I see it now, we are ignoring even the most vulnerable of our society. And this is where I see that we have a great need. This is why I'm running for governor. It is our children's future that we have to defend. So my big promise is that as governor, I will ensure that I fight for you, our citizens, each and every day, to ensure that government works for you, not against you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jasper, and uh, College of Idaho, all of you for showing up. Uh, Paulette, uh, thanks for entering into the arena. Uh, I know from experience these are uh, uh, demanding campaigns, but uh, as I alluded to when I started, uh, as I've had the incredible opportunity to serve as in the Senate and leadership in a variety of areas, and, and particularly with the view, the bird's eye view I've had uh, from my offices as, as a lieutenant governor, and to look at the incredible array of issues that the governor has to, uh, the chief executive officer of the state has to address. You know, I hearken back to my ranching days about what was the most important thing to me at the ranch, and that was, you know, we had to pay the bills, but I wanted to have an opportunity to pass our ranch on to our kids and our grandchildren. So I look at this job and I say, what one thing, every morning when you get up, when every decision comes across your desk, whether it's a, whether it's a disaster, a fire, a flood, uh, whether it's a, an appointment to the courts, whether it's a, the appointment, cabinet appointments, whether it's making investments in education, economic development, healthcare, fixing corrections, what one thing do I make that decision based on? And to me, it's, it's pretty simple. How do we create an environment to where, as I said, our kids that have been here for generations are the ones that just moved here, where they're gonna make the decision to stay here in Idaho, that we're gonna have a good education system, that we're gonna have affordable and accessible uh, healthcare, that we're gonna have an infrastructure so they can continue to thrive and have a good job. And I am in 
incredibly comfortable with that position, that those decisions, those decisions that come to me, those decisions that come to the cabinet, those decisions that I uh, uh, converse with the legislature on, that they'll all be through that one decision lens. And uh, with your help, hopefully I'll get to have that opportunity. Thank you very much. candidates here. I think we, this could be up on YouTube too, we really showed people something here. While Washington, D.C., they're fighting, bickering about issues that nobody really cares about, we came here and we had a civil, thoughtful conversation about issues that affect the people every single day. And I want to thank these two for sort of playing the game with me so we could actually do this and be educational. I also want to thank the, the Idaho Center for Fiscal Policy, especially Lauren Gupchia and Desmond Jones for helping to organize the event. <laughs> Got to give thanks to the College of Idaho. <laughs> and our our co-presidents, Doug Brigham, Jim Everett, and their amazing assistant, Enica Severa. Joe Hughes and his communication staff for letting everyone know about this. Deidre Fridley. Deidre Fridley, the master and guardian of all events at the college. Alan Price, the IT genius who helped send this out into cyberspace. But I want to thank you, the audience, both here in the auditorium and online. You took the time to become informed and knowledgeable which I see as the keystone to a functioning democracy. To paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, a well-informed citizenry is the heart of a dynamic democracy and the best defense against tyranny. But also remember what Oscar Wilde said, there's no sin except stupidity. <laughs> May you have a peaceful and blessed evening. Thank you all. Thanks, sir.